Picture a world where digital assets roam free, untamed and chaotic. Now imagine a seasoned explorer venturing into this wild frontier armed with nothing but experience and a well-crafted map. That explorer is Caravan Malson, Managing Director at AVP, and today she's sharing her map with all of us. Welcome to the Damn Right Podcast, where we're about to embark on a journey through AVP's operational model for damn success. Kara's not just showing us the lay of the land, she's handing out compasses and canteens, ensuring we're all equipped to navigate the sometimes treacherous terrain of digital asset management. And the best part, this expedition is open to everyone. No secret handshake required, though a secret handshake for damn professionals would be pretty cool. By the end of this episode, you might just be ready to lead your own damn expedition. Or at least you'll be able to find that one logo file without having to send an all staff email with the subject line, urgent, has anyone seen our logo? So grab your metaphorical machete and join us as we hack through the dense jungle of metadata, governance, and user engagement. And here's a little something extra to help you on your damn journey. We've partnered with Henry Stewart to give two lucky listeners 50% off their registration for the Henry Stewart Damn New York Conference on October 23rd and 24th. Just visit the link shown here, which will also be in the show notes and enter to win. It's like finding a shortcut through the fire swamp of digital assets, minus the rodents of unusual size and lightning sand. And the only flame spurts will be the brilliant ideas you get from going to such a great event. So enter to win today and I hope to see you there. Oh, and before we jump in, remember, damn right, because it's too important to get wrong. I'd like to kick us off with uh, just having you tell us a little bit, care about where the piece came from and what the inspiration was. Sure. So the operational model for Dam Success comes out of years of experience of working with clients of all different types, all different industries, shapes and sizes. Um, and of course, you know that um, Dam is a technology related initiative, of course. But over time, we started to think about what are the factors that really contribute to DAM success. DAM success relies on much more than just technology and that there are many, many other factors and capabilities that are required to have digital asset management be successful and impactful for the organizations that are implementing it. So that's really where it came from. Um, we, we tried to kind of piece together uh, what we saw as the factors for success and created this operational model um, to, to provide kind of an abstraction of the concepts behind um, damn success as we saw them. When you look at the model, um, you know, it can come off as being really overwhelming. Uh, it's, it seems big. Uh, a lot of people might just be thinking, can I just get a, a, a dam and just, you know, plug and play, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how, how realistic is it to, to implement this model? Well, think about what a model does. It's essentially a representation of the world or of, I mean, of, some, of some aspect of the world. So in this case, it is a representation of how a dam is run and the capabilities that go into its operations. So that's what we call it, the operational model. Um, and it's it's just an abstraction. So when you think about applying it, there's a few different ways you could consider that. So one is to use it for planning and think about we are implementing a dam um, or a digital asset management program. What are the factors or what are the capabilities we're going to need to be successful? So so that's one way. Another way to do it is to use it as a way of evaluating your own existing digital asset management operations. So if you take this and you kind of overlay it onto your existing program and see where maybe you have some gaps. So this try, tries to give you the full picture of the those capabilities that you need to succeed and help you figure out either um, whether you're doing them now or where, how you might want to, uh, where, what areas you might want to improve. Does this work for all organizations, this model, or does it only work for some? Do you have to be particularly well-resourced or of a certain size, or can smaller organizations also use this model? Who, who does it work for? I think this model really works for any organization that's running a digital asset management operation. I think the critical factor is uh, the size of the asset collection that you're managing. At a certain scale, it starts to become more relevant. So if you've only got, you know, a handful of dozens or hundreds 
of digital assets that you're managing, this is probably going to be a little bit overkill. But when you're really running a full-scale operation with a dedicated technology um, that's possibly an enterprise-scale solution or even kind of in a large division or work group setting, um, that's when this starts to become really applicable. Now, some smaller organizations have extremely large collections of digital assets. So I would say just because they're small doesn't mean they don't need to apply this. This is still really useful because orchestrating and managing all of those assets and stewarding them, stewarding them over time and ensuring they deliver ongoing value is, is really essential. So this will be applicable to those smaller institutions as well, just as much as it is for large enterprises. You use the term DAM uh, in the piece and operational model for DAM success. And I'm just curious, you know, should people who have a MAM or a PAM or maybe a digital preservation solution, should they read that? Is this not being for them or is there anything notably different about a dam versus these other types of systems that also manage or work with digital assets? We use the, the word dam or digital asset management broadly at AVP. So when we say dam or digital asset management, we're really talking about any of the types of um, systems, tools, programs that are used to help manage some kinds of digital files that have value to the organization um, over time, essentially. So that could be a DAM, a MAM, a PAM, um, digital preservation system, um, anything like that. So so no, we're, de we're definitely not exclusive when we say DAM and, and we, we define DAM very broadly. Um, so we tend to use the phrase digital asset management it, without using the acronym to encompass all of those aspects. So why should leadership at, or at an organization uh, look at this model and care about and maybe invest in getting the model right. Digital asset management is often seen as a technology initiative. And there's a misconception at play sometimes that if you just get the right tool and turn it on, you're good to go. Uh, maybe just some data migration to get the assets in there and metadata. But after that, you know, it should run itself. And I think that's an important misconception that puts stand stamp apart from a lot of other enterprise tools. Um, and so it's, it's, it's unique in a lot of ways to manage a digital asset management system and to build a program around it that's going to allow it to be sustainable and deliver value to the organization. You, it is not a plug and play type of thing, unfortunately, for better or for worse. So we have to think about what has to go into the full set of capabilities for delivering the value and getting the ROI on that technology investment, which is often not insignificant. I guess maybe flipping that question on its head a little bit, could you speak to, you know, what are the holistic costs, holistic meaning not just financial, but what are the holistic costs uh, associated with getting damn implementation wrong, not following this model or being particularly weak in areas of this model? Well, like you said, the financial costs are real to getting digital asset management implementation wrong. So um, there's typically a large upfronting cost that goes into procuring and getting that initial implementation off the ground, um, getting it configured, installed, and all of the setup costs that go along with that. So there's real financial costs. A lot of resources go into that, services, tools, technology, and a lot of people's time. Um, but when it doesn't go well, um, beyond that, there are really goodwill costs. So there's usually a lot of um, stakeholder buy-in and anticipation that builds up with a big implementation like this. And when it goes dramatically wrong, those people are going to lose trust and confidence in your ability to do anything like this again in the future. And the other thing is the dam was selected and implemented to solve some existing problem. Um, and without it being successfully implemented and maintained and operated, then you're going to be falling back on the status quo. And that status quo was not satisfactory to begin with. So now you're kind of back where you started, probably in a worse state than where you in, were in before. You've lost the goodwill um, and buy-in from stakeholders. Um, and whatever those threats were or, or losses or opportunities that the dam was going to help solve are now going to be amplified. So if it was, say, um, saving time was one of the things you were trying to solve for, well, now you're going to be exacerbating that issue 
Um, maybe it was reducing risk, maybe risk of loss, or maybe risk of misuse. Um, and so, again, those problems have now not gone away. And so those are continued risk that you're going to have to find some way to solve or mitigate. You center your model around purpose, I think is really interesting, because again, as you said, yeah, these are te technological solutions. Um, I don't think probably a lot of people will go right to purpose. Uh, so I'd love to hear just a little bit about why is it that you centered this whole model around purpose? Purpose is the center of the model for a reason. The digital asset management system and the digital asset management program were implemented to solve a problem. Maybe that was cost savings. Maybe that was time savings. Maybe that was reducing risk. Whatever it was, there's a reason for it. And that is the core kind of kernel of the purpose. But there's a little more to it than that. So if we think about uh, the landscape of digital assets at an organization, especially as we go out to larger scale collections or larger scale institutions, we can't really uh, solve for everything at once. And so we have to prioritize. And this is also where the purpose comes in. And so what we like to think about for the purpose is kind of a who, a how, and a what. So who is this for? Who, who is actually, who is it serving? Who needs digital assets? That's the first question. And think about this again in a priority order. Who are the people who need digital assets the most? The second question is how? How do they want to use them? What is it that they want to use them for? What are those kind of high-level use cases that they need digital assets to, to help them address? And the third is what digital assets, what data do they need? So if we kind of orchestrate those three things together, who is it, what, did, what do they want to do, and what assets do they need? And then an important part of that what question is at what quality? What does quality mean to those people? So does quality or value of the digital asset mean just having the file? Does it mean having the file with all the metadata and the rights information? Does it mean having kind of large sets of data? We have to really understand what they need and what quality means to them to build the digital asset management solutions going to deliver that value. So that's why we put that at the center and we think about the who, the how, and the what when we're trying to design and prioritize the solution that the digital asset management program is going to be providing. In the people section of this piece, uh, you talk about three different types of user groups that it's really important for them to be engaged. I wonder if you could just give us a quick overview of those, those user groups and tell us a little bit about why it's important to engage each of them in the process. So people are a really important part of the model because there's a lot of different types of people that are going to be involved in this, and it's important to differentiate their role. So one of those groups is going to be your end users. And those are people who almost either exclusively or in, in combination with another role are going to be trying to find, access, and utilize the assets. So for that group, it's really important that we understand what is it they're trying to find, how are they searching, how are they navigating and browsing, or how would they prefer to if we don't actually have anything to evaluate today, and then how can we respond to best meet their needs? So they're our customer, and we have to make sure that our solution is going to be able to allow them to, to shop for what they're looking for. The second group is the contributor group. And so those are the people, and sometimes some of these people are in your end user group as well, um, but this is when they wear the hat of uh, the people who are going to be submitting content or submitting assets to the system. Maybe they do that directly or maybe it's indirectly through some other party. Um, but they're the people who are going to be getting assets, they're creating assets or providing assets that will go into the system. And for them, there's going to be certain workflows that are going to enable them to do that most efficiently. And that's one of the key pieces to solve for with that group of people is what is it that we can do to make that process as simple and easy as possible to get those assets in in a timely manner with the information that we need to serve the end users. And then the third group is more of your administrator role, the people who actually kind of help keep the dam running. And so maybe that's one person, maybe that's a team of people, but those are the people who are going to be doing the quality control, who are going to be configuring the system, who are going to be um, creating policies around the system and, and procedures. 
that could be a team of people as well that might include um, stakeholders from different parts of the organization. So it might be technology partnering with um, somebody else in, in your business unit. Um, so a lot of times that that is a team of people who work together to make sure that the system is kept up to date, um, configured to meet the needs of the users, um, that the vocabularies are, are there and the taxonomy is there. Um, all the metadata is there, and so to really just make it work. So that's those are the the three groups. With each group, it's important to engage. It's important to have them be participating in the process of building and scaling out the digital asset management solution. Um, you can do that with representatives from the end user communities, for example. So maybe your end users include a combination of people in marketing, sales, product. Um, development. And so you can you can engage with representatives of each of those groups to be your beta testers, to kind of be your user testers, and just to keep learning directly from them. And that's the thing that we want to emphasize in this model is that we we really push the idea of direct engagement with end users, not making assumptions about their needs, not kind of trying to um, use what you know about them to to create those solutions, but direct engagement. Um, and I think it's similar for your contributor role people is directly engaging, working very closely and collaboratively to create workflows that are going to be simple and effective for that type of user as well. And then of course your dis digital asset management administration or management team, you're gonna to have to be working very closely together to ensure that everything is kind of running smoothly and that's where we get into governance, but that's another topic. Well, that's a good segue into the next question. That is the next section in this piece is governance. And from what I've seen, my personal experience has been that governance is often maybe the biggest uh, pitfall that organizations run into uh, that leads to a threat to the success of their damn programs. I'm wondering if you could tell us um, what does governance look like when it's robust and really well done uh, compared to what is what does governance look like when it's you know, lacking and, and maybe uh, maybe a threat to success? In this model, governance touches on a few different aspects. Some of those are decision making, roles and responsibilities, policies and standards. So when we think about decision making, that's the place where things often get stuck from the beginning. So if there's nobody to kind of make strategic decisions to decide where to invest resources in building out the dam system or the dam program, to decide what to prioritize, to decide who should be responsible for what, um, and and to, to make some of those key decisions, that is where we've seen things go wrong from the very beginning. That decision-making, uh, if there's a vacuum there, you can just end up spinning your wheels trying to do things by consensus um, when different stakeholders might have different understandings and it just gets messy very quickly. So, so that's the first part of uh, where things can go wrong. The second is roles and responsibilities. If these aren't well-defined and clear and understood by all the stakeholders who are involved in, in running and operating the digital asset management system, um, things can also get messy there and you end up in some stalemates. Um, and that trickles down into things like the policies and the standards, for instance. So if you don't have decision making on who creates standards for the system, then you don't end up with standards or you end up with competing standards. And if you don't have roles and responsibilities of who actually is responsible for building or maintaining certain standards. So let's take taxonomy, for example. If it's unclear um, or it's not defined who is the one who can create new terms, who can um, dis, you know, delete terms, or who can um, decide really what to do with any kind of vocabulary or taxonomy term, um, you may have multiple people doing that um, and you end up with a mess. So the governance part makes sure that things uh, stay, that the quality is maintained. And that's really what you're aiming for with all of this. That's, you gave us some great insights in there to like what to look like when it's not working well. What are the possible you know, areas of risk? Are there any signatures to, you know, that you've seen when you've gone into an organization and maybe they just nailed governance? They've done it perfectly. Uh, you know, 
what does that look like? How does it act differently? Like, is there, are there any notable signs of when governance is going really well? There's certainly signs when governance are, is going well. And that's just that things are working. Um, so when, when governance is going well, there's really someone or a small group of someones who can make decisions quickly and efficiently um, so things don't get stuck and, and the, syst- the system and the program continue to build, to grow um, quickly over time. Um, so, so that is definitely a sign that things are working. Um, and, and then when you just see that the overall quality of the data, the digital assets, um, or the user experience is, is positive, um, is clearly a sign that things are going well. And that's usually because, um, the stewardship of metadata, of taxonomy have been well delegated to the right roles and responsibilities, um, that those things are being created, they're being managed and maintained, um, that's not kind of be, being left, um, out to the void. So certainly those are the signs that governance is going well. And so when it is going well, the whole thing just works. It's it's really one of the key pieces of this model. And now on to the next section, which is technology, which is probably the first thing that people think of when they think of DAM. Uh, notably in this section, uh, you talk about two things, uh, configuration and integration, uh, among other things. But I think what someone might think when they read that is, uh, you know, haven't I just gone, maybe I've just gone through a, a technology selection process where I've documented all my requirements, my use cases, I've done usage scenarios, I've vetted available solutions in the marketplace against those. Isn't it now time to just plug and play? I've done all the hard work, time to have fun and get to, get to work. Um, tell me about, you know, what are the things that people, you know, if they, what are the things that people uh, might not expect that still need to be done, like configuration and integration. So once you have the system and if you've gone through a technology selection process where you really have outlined requirements, usage scenarios, and you've done your kind of due diligence, um, kudos to you for doing all of that in advance. Um, that doesn't always happen. But if you did do all of that, it's the implementation phase is going to be a level of granularity deeper. So you'll use all of that great stuff that you did during the selection process and kind of dive a little deeper with that. And it gives you the framework to start from, um, but you'll quickly realize that there will be gaps. And so some of those things that you'll need to continue building out are things like your metadata model. So exactly what does that look like? You may have not fully developed that ahead of the selection of the tool. Um, the permissions model is a really big piece that will, again, come from that governance. It's going to come from policies and deciding who can do what in the system. What are they allowed to do? Um, what are they allowed to see? And like, what, what kind of access do they have? And what can they do with this, with the, with the assets they do have available to them? It's one of the biggest benefits and the most powerful aspects of the dam is that permissions management. But there's a lot of thinking and decision making that goes into making that work. So you're going to get into that layer very quickly. Um, The other piece is that you probably thought ahead of time, uh, hey, we need to plug this into a broader ecosystem. And absolutely, it it should be. Dam should not be an island. Um, But you're not going to be able to tackle that everything at once. Um, So prioritization is going to be important, figuring out what are the most key integrations that we can do at this time. So it's going to be a starting to, uh, it's going to be a matter of prioritizing and starting to incrementally build out the solution. As you go, you're going to be also wanting to make sure that your assumptions about what users need are is correct. Um, so maybe before you get very far into it, you're going to be doing some work with your users that you've identified already, who are those user groups, and what are some of my representative stakeholders that I can work with from those groups, and engaging them early on, understanding, again, there are their kind of their their needs, what how they might search, the kinds of browse uh, terms that they might use, so you can start building that out in response. So your whole navigational experience can really work for their needs. And then as you build incrementally, you can start testing with them as well. So as you can see, it's a, it's really a process. Um, it it takes some time. It's hard to do this right out of the box. And different DAM tools kind of can be stood up more quickly than others. There's quite a range of solutions on the market, some of which are very headless. And so in those cases, you might need to really be building out the entire interface 
Um, whereas others are kind of, you know, have an elegant front end design that you can just plug and play into. So those factors as well may contribute to how quickly you get this off the ground. Okay, so the next section in the piece is process. And in some ways, this might seem to be a no brainer to people. They look at it and they say, well, of course, we have to document our processes. But the way that you talk about it, and I know the way that you think about it does a little bit deeper than that. Could you tell us why process is important and how you think about it in this model? Process is a really important component of this model because it helps ensure the ongoing quality and value of the system over time. This is a living system. It's going to be added to all the time, so we have to keep it up and running. Um, so the processes directly stem from the policies, which were created in our governance section of the model, um, and they define a few different things. So one is, um, you know, just things, your how-to guides, how to get data in, how to tag things appropriately, how to, um, and so a lot of that is your backend users, how to do administrative functions. And then on the front end, it's also about how, you know, processes for getting access to the system. Um, how do they go about getting an account or how do they go about doing using the tool? So maybe that type of process takes a different form. Sometimes it's a written step-by-step -step how to guide for your, your backend users, but your front end users might need uh, a video tutorial that they can quickly access directly in the tool. Um, or other forms. So thinking about who needs what processes documented and what is the best way to communicate to those people. So that's one piece. Um, that, and then thinking about that documentation and then how that's delivered. So keeping the documentation up to date and then keeping it, you know, training people when training is needed and making sure that that all happens in a kind of timely and consistent manner. And the last thing I think that falls under this uh, part of the model is the data flow. So process isn't just human workflow, but it's also data flow and data orchestration between uh, integrated systems. So making sure we have good documentation on how data moves between systems, what are systems of record for which pieces of data, um, and, and just kind of getting that all up, up, kept up to date as well is a really important type of process documentation to create. So could you speak to uh, the role of documentation under the banner of process uh, with regard to what it allows or enables uh, related to deploying a dam more broadly within an organization? So, right. So process and process documentation is going to be key to scale. Um, at first, the system may be deployed to a smaller part of the organization, but you're going to be rolling it out and expanding to more of the enterprise over time in many cases. Um, so that documentation, keeping it up to date and growing it is going to help you with the scale scalability. Once you've onboarded one set of users, you probably have a set of documentation you can repurpose for onboarding another set of users, for example. Once you've trained one system administrator or one kind of QC moderator, uh, you can train another one. So you can start to scale out in that way. This is also going to help when there's turnover. Inevit inevitably, people are going to leave or change roles. And so when you bring on new people, the process documentation is going to be key to getting them up and running quickly and not just taking up all the time of the dam manager. So this is something that we see quite often at institutions is that um, lack of documentation and everything being sort of institutional knowledge is one of the inhibitors to scale and growth. So process documentation becomes key to helping with that. So the next section in the in the piece is measurement. I'm wondering if you could speak to why is measurement important for organizations and how does it fit into the model? Measurement is important because this is the way we can evaluate whether we're getting a return on all of our efforts. So there's, again, we've gone through a lot of things that, that it, within this model already that are, is in place to make this dam system or dam operation a success. So how do we know it's a success? This is where measurement comes in. Um, and so when we think about measurement in digital asset management, we often think about the analytics that the tool provides. And so that's a really key and important set of functionality that you'll want to configure within your system to get the right reportings, the right data, um, so that you're measuring the things that are important to you. So this also goes back to governance and deciding what uh, metrics are important to you and then implementing and configuring the system to give you that information. There's another piece to measurement that is, uh, I think, often overlooked, which is the user satisfaction component. So that for, for that, we're going to have to do a little bit more 
uh, qualitative analysis and measurement. And so this comes back to engaging with people, um, seeing if they are getting the value that they're expecting from the system, um, seeing if there are opportunities to improvement, and kind of taking all of that data, quantitative and qualitative, and use that to evaluate where we've where we've been, where we're going, and what we need to do next. So when we gather quantitative and qualitative data, we can do a lot with that. We can use it for planning and goal setting for maybe our next year or next quarter. Um, we can use it for reporting and sharing out. So we can we can share this information with our key stakeholders and sponsors um, to let them know what the return on their efforts and investment looks like. The next section in your piece is called culture. And you, you, you have a sentence in there that I really love. You say that if purpose is the core of your dance implementation, that culture is the driving force, uh, which I think really hits home and resonates. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit more about how, how do you think about culture in this model uh, and how, why should people care about culture related to the implementation of a dam? The reason we call this section culture is because it's a way of thinking about um, a shift from maybe my data to our data, to really making um, the digital asset management um, something that we have shared ownership in as an organization. And so that's, that's kind of a cultural change, whereas maybe things used to be managed by individuals in very siloed environments. Now it's something that the organization um, can, can get behind it and help drive and build together. And so we think about a few different ways that um, the culture around this can help continue its growth and development. And so um, thinking about things like goal setting and planning and figuring out how the dam can help advance strategic goals as those continue to evolve and grow. So kind of keeping in touch with leadership priorities and trying to use the dam as, as a key service or tool that can help advance some of those priorities. Um, we also think about culture and the way people work together. So what are the most collaborative ways we can work together um, to continue this operation and be successful? Do we need to do things like Agile or um, and Scrum and things like that and kind of keep us moving forward? Um, which relates to things like goal setting and planning and what are the mechanisms that we actually um, create plans, create roadmaps, keep ourselves moving forward toward those things um, together as a, as a team. Um, and so, uh, and then as well as change management, we think about here too, if this is a valuable tool to our organization, we want to continue to scale and grow it. We need to be sure and be deliberate um, in the ways that we communicate its role to the organization as it continues to expand and that we kind of bring people along into this new kind of culture of our data or our digital assets and kind of continue to scale that, that system so it can deliver the value that everybody's looking for. It brings us to the conclusion of the piece, which I love the title, it's time for some damn success. Um, and and I guess I'd like to hear, you know, it's clear from this piece and 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 all your thought leadership that you, this is something that you have a lot of experience and expertise in, uh, as well as uh, the team that you lead at AVP. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how people should think about what AVP could bring to the table to support them in their efforts to um, implement and uh, make sure that they've got um, a healthy uh, program that that's measuring high on on this. Uh, on this dam model? Yeah, so we use the dam operational model in pretty much all aspects of our services. So we have planned services where we can help organizations um, develop visions and develop roadmaps to, to reach those visions. We use the operational model to think about what are the capabilities that are gonna need to be built out to meet that vision. Um, we use it in our activate services where we're helping organizations implement either initially or kind of grow and expand their dam implementations. And we help them really with the programmatic approach to digital asset management, where we're not just building the technology solution, but we're building the program. And so this is the model that we use to help uh, have conversations with our clients and help them think about all the aspects that are gonna go into making this implementation a success. Um, so we, we use it in a number of ways um, within our services. Um, and we're also working on uh, a tool that will be a self-assessment tool that we'll be providing soon 
that will allow you to kind of evaluate your own maturity in the digital asset management operational model and use that as a way to think about what are some areas we may need to uh, do some work in and do some planning around that. So it's great to hear that you know, on the horizon is, is some addition um, to this, the self-assessment model that you just mentioned. Um, what, what else is next on the horizon for this? We continue to evolve the digital asset management operational model as we apply it in our work. So we're using this every day uh, with our clients. And as we do that, we, we find things that we might need to tweak or, or expand on or improve how we're communicating with around it. So we're, we're constantly doing that work to just refine it, improve it. Um, we are also uh, trying to get feedback from our clients and hopefully from other members of the community. Um, what do you think that we can do to improve this model and really make it a resource for the community um, of digital asset management professionals?